All right, today on BRS TV, we have the top 15 yes. pH mistakes. Yeah. So you're gonna hear like all the mistakes that uh, I've made in the last like 15 years. Uh, you're gonna see, you know, probably some of the things of why it matters, why it doesn't matter, uh, different areas where we could see improvement, all kinds of things I wish I had done, you know? Yeah. And we're gonna start off with number one. Number one of the 15 things, what is it? Same thing as our, our skimmers, and that's uh, assuming that it doesn't matter. Because uh, in this case, pH matters, absolutely. Yeah, and, you know, so here's the thing, man, is like you probably monitored pH in the beginning. Uh, the first thing I bought was a pH meter. So and... I bought a pH test kit first for me, okay. and then did the color change, but I had no idea why. Uh, like, what, why am I testing this? No, no idea. Yeah. So today, you're gonna definitely figure out why it matters, but the number one fail is just shrugging your shoulders at it and assuming it doesn't matter because for sure by the end of this, uh, even if you believe that now, I think that you're gonna change your mind by the end of today's video. All right, so in stark contrast to that statement, <laughs> number two uh, mistake uh, with pH and reef tanks, what is it? Uh, that's chasing that 8.3 dragon. Yeah, uh, dude. Uh, if you're chasing the 8.3 dragon, you can <laughs> definitely find yourself uh, uh, just dumping chemicals in, solving all kinds of problems. Yeah. And there are some benefits to 8.3, but it isn't worth uh, being a mad scientist. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a common goal with uh, some of these tank parameters and following tank, tank parameters and chasing tank parameters. And pH is not uh, any less one of them. But yeah, like you said, mad scientist, the amount of equipment and things you can hurt, you can dose or have heard the dose or people have told you to do to uh, affect pH uh, can bigger headache than anything else. Okay. So related to that, the next uh, number three here uh, uh, mistake is make sure the problem's actually real, right? So you're saying if, whether it's a, high, a problem with high pH or too high pH, mm -hmm. or a problem most commonly with low or too low pH, mm -hmm. uh, it might not even be a problem at all. Yeah, so I see all the time like people say, oh, my pH is 7.3 or it's uh, 9, uh, but the tank looks fine. Yeah. Okay, if, the, if you're running consistent 8 point, or uh, 7.3 or 9 and your tank looks fine, uh, it, you got user error. It might right? not be a pH problem at all. <clears throat> yeah. And test the equipment. Yeah. The, the test kit or which is uh, a lot of times those test kits are just in, are inherently like not accurate mm -hmm. and hard to judge because they're color based. Uh, but even your even your monitoring equipment, the pH probe itself, they drift over time. Something can get you know bump them, do what have you, and throw them off. So it might not even be a pH problem. Yeah, most of the times, if your testing equipment tells you something totally crazy, it's because it's not working. <laughs> it's true. not because something totally crazy is happening. Yeah. Uh, and so if you have a, TA, a pH probe. All you need to do is uh, dip it in the seven or the 10. If it reads it right or both right, uh, you know for sure that the tool is probably working, right? Uh, and then with your test kit too, if you're using a pH test kit, just get another one and double check it before you start like going down the path of trying to fix something that maybe doesn't need fixing. Right. Uh, and especially if you're thinking about it like, oh, I have 8.0 8 and I'm really shooting for 8.3. A probe could very easily be off by you know 0 0.2, 0 0.2 anyway. Yeah, exactly. So make sure that like what the problem you're trying to solve is actually real, and that's definitely number three. And so number four related to that is uh, I'll let you go with directly it. related to that recalibrating the probe versus just checking it. So I mean a lot of times, and I'm guilty of this one. This was uh, what I every time I would go check my probe rather than just check the probe. I'd just pull out a packet because they're like a dollar a piece, you know, and I'd go ahead and go through the entire recalibration process to recalibrate my monitoring probe. When in all actuality, all I have to do is I have a known solution here, like 7.001 or what have you. If I dip my probe in there and it reads right at that, uh, like 7.0, then I really don't need to recalibrate at all. The thing's working just fine. In fact, you may be more likely to mess it up than fix anything, mm. right? And so every recalibration process, you have a chance to like actually mess it up. So that's the thing is people ask all the time, like how often should I recalibrate my probes? And that's not the right question to ask. Not true. The question is to ask, how often should I check my probes? Yes. Right? Yeah. And so when, if I were to say how often you should recalibrate it, I'd say every six months to a year maybe, I don't know. Right. But pretty infrequently. <clears throat> but I actually wouldn't calibrate it at all as long as it's reading this thing. So if I were to say how often should I check it, 
I'd say once a month. Or once a because month. Because it's a dollar, yeah. and all I gotta do is stick the probe in there and find out if it reads it right, and if it does, I'll put it back in, and I'm done. 12 right? bucks a year, I mean, yeah. that's cheap. That's probably one of the cheapest yeah. things here on the Only Only go through all the process of recalibrating if it's reading wrong. All right, so the number five pH mistake, this is actually a super important one. What is it? This is not understanding why pH even matters, which, uh, guilty. Uh, I've tested, monitored, and everything across the years, pH, chased pH, uh, but not until recently did I really get a firm grasp on what pH is even doing in my tank and how it relates to my corals. Yeah, so I've also been guilty of that. I was told I need to be 7.8 to 8.3 in the beginning and that you should be closer to 8.3, but why? like, you know, it wasn't really clear why that right. was, right? Yeah. And so uh, what it is, is because the corals grow faster, mm. right? And so at 8.3, the corals are able to calcify faster and inside the coral's tissue, that it's able to get rid of uh, acidity or carbonic acid much faster, which allows it to precipitate out the coral and it just grows faster. We did some experiments here mm -hmm. uh, in BRS TV Investigates and we were able to demonstrate that it grows as much as 50% yeah, faster, true. right? If you maintain it at, at 8.3 all the time. All right, so also there's all kinds of information out there about the ocean, like endless studies on the acidification yeah. of the ocean from carbonic acid and CO2 in the air. And so we all know this, like science shows this all over the place. However, it's not really always easy to maintain 8.3 all the time in the tank. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the things that you see in the ocean are related to like uh, a less dense skeleton, that they're more susceptible to uh, stressful issues and stuff. So here's the thing is we do want to uh, maintain it near 8.3 if we can without like playing mad scientist. Yeah, yeah. And the reason for that is solely related to uh, coral growth and having a denser skeleton that doesn't break as easy and just overall a healthier coral. All right, so these next two are maybe, if you only heard two things today, these are probably the most important that you hear today in the mistakes. Gems. And number six is? Number six is not knowing what to do before a spike happens, a pH spike happens. So I'm monitoring my tank, everything's going along fine, and then I get an alert or some, I look at my, you know, my monitor and I see that the pH has just jumped up by, maybe it's 9.0 now, maybe it's higher than 9.0. But now I'm scrambling to pull out the computer and find out, well, how do I fix it? Better to know before how to fix it before it even happens. Yeah, absolutely. So that happened to me once, uh, actually more than once, but definitely <laughs> the first time. And uh, I had my autotopo failed and dumped uh, like, I don't know, probably eight gallons of uh, kelp wasser <sighs> into my tank, right? pH is, I don't know how high. The yeah. tank's total snow, it's white, whatever. Mm. And so the reason that that tank didn't skip a beat, I lost some Xenia, but that was really it. Yeah. Uh, a couple of crabs and stuff, but uh, almost everything survived is because I was able to find the right information immediately. Which right? may not happen in every case, but yeah, you were lucky. I was lucky in the essence I stumbled upon it and I just believed it. Uh, yeah. Because the biggest thing here is if you know what to do beforehand, you can just go implement it. If you don't, you're gonna go spend three hours researching Critical it, time. trying to figure out who to listen to and who not to, uh, and sort through all the shenanigans before you can act. The biggest problem here is you need to act quickly, yeah. right? And so in this case, uh, my pH was off the hook. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was way off the scale. And uh, it was dump vinegar in, right? The problem here is I need to get the pH down to a safe level fast, right? Yeah. And so like, this is kind of one of those things where you're hearing all those people and it's, they're like debating. Yeah, it's contrary to popular belief where we always hear nothing good happens fast in a reef tank. Uh, catastrophically, right now, you know, if, you're, if your pH is high and you've had something like this happen, no, it, it's better to get it down fast. So this is one of the fast things to correct a problem. Yeah, so some of the advice out there is like, well, you should slowly raise it a point, uh, you know, tenth of a point every hour or something. Yeah. Wrong. Uh, I'm just going <laughs> to say, I don't say wrong like that very often. Your water right now is basically poison, yeah. right? Uh, and it's true. Get it out of poison range as fast as humanly possible. So you'd mentioned like dump, uh, dump vinegar in the tank, but actually we there is a, a way to measure it rather than just taking a bottle of vinegar and just pouring, starting to pour it in there. So uh, we had talked about when we were talking about this problem. There, I mean, there's a couple solutions that we came up with. One was there is the vinegar, uh, mm -hmm. which is organic carbon source. A lot of people dose to the tank, but it inherently has that. It will buffer that pH. Bring so it down. A little goes a long way. When I say yeah. dump, too, uh, it's like teaspoon teaspoons at a, time. at a time. Monitor, see if anything happens. Maybe if it's not dropping at all or hardly at all, 
go to a t tablespoon, but slow little bits at a time. I would do one teaspoon and then wait like uh, five minutes and see what happens mm. to it and then adjust because everybody's tank size is different. The pH uh, problem you're dealing with is different. Uh, and then adjust from the one teaspoon. Yeah. But there's another way to do this. Uh, cool. I just uh, don't recommend it in every instance. Uh, uh, there's actually a lot of different ways. Yeah. These are some popular uh, home-based remedies that almost anybody has. Uh, and so it's just distilled white vinegar that people use, yeah. by the way. And then naturally, I mean, a lot of people's minds go to, well, what about, what about a water change? Right? Mm. Can I just do a, a massive water change and solve the problem? Uh, and we were set, what we were talking about, yeah, I mean, that, that is, in your case, uh, like the E1 70 when we had something like this happen it was was it ph based but uh yeah if you have the water available to do like 90 percent or maybe 75 percent or more where you're actually putting a dent in the problem rather than just taking you know 20 percent of the ph because you only have enough water for 20 percent water change it's probably not going to work as effectively as if you can do 75 percent or more uh, so if you have the ability to larger systems probably not feasible. Yeah, I would say water change is not the best solution because you want to have make this happen fast and doing a 20% water change isn't going to mm. really do a big thing. But if you have like a giant size tank here and I was like, my problem was like a, I have a 200 gallon tank and I have a 40 gallon tank over here. We actually just water change that some of this water into that one yeah. and you know, like do a hundred percent water change over here with cycled warm water. But I wouldn't recommend that. I'd actually say the, the vinegar is a much better option. Mm. And then for some of you out there, also soda water, which is just uh, CO2 in water. Yeah. Uh, I'd probably stay away from buying the stuff like in a bottle. But if like you happen to have like a soda stream at your house, you know, you just go get some RODI water and you know, inject with inject CO2. food grade yeah. CO2 into yeah. it. And you can pour the stuff right in there. And again, a little goes a long way. So do a little bit and then pour or wait five minutes, see what happens. But the carbonic acid from uh, the CO2 water uh, will also work. So that is what you should do. And you should just know that beforehand that what you really, really want to do is get it down as fast as humanly possible. So now that you know, like say you don't even have the distilled white vinegar at your yeah. house, what you could do is see this problem, run. Yeah. You know, you yeah. know, you don't have to go to your computer to research. You now know yeah. exactly what to do. All right, so inverse of that is obviously <laughs> number seven. Yeah, which is not knowing what to do beforehand when you have a low pH drop or spike. Uh, so it's not opposite of a spike, so there's a drop in pH. And all of a sudden my tank was reading, you know, 7.6, 7.7, 7.8, and I'm starting to see a decline and I'm getting my alarms are going off. Hey, it's 6.5, hey, it's 5.5, you know. Uh, now what do I do? So the number one thing you do is go test your probe because yeah. most of the time it's because your probe failed if it's going down. Yeah. There aren't a lot of reasons why it would pH would plummet in your tank mm -hmm. real fast, mm -hmm. right? Maybe your alkalinity, you let it drop to uh, super, super low levels, but that would kind of happen over time. Yeah, right? you'd see some trends like that. Yeah. And build up a CO2 in the ambient room, you'd see a slow decline, not an instant drop. Yeah, so if I was like at 7.8 and all of a sudden, boom, I'm at seven, like two hours later, I would definitely check my equipment. Yeah. But the most popular reason for that is actually gonna be like because something happened with your calcium reactor, which is also a fairly rare piece of equipment. Right. You know, like, what, maybe one, uh, uh, 5% uh, of the community uses them, uh, just because they're kind of expensive and a little bit more complex. But like, that is probably the number one reason. There yeah. aren't a lot of reasons for the pH to plummet. So when people say that, especially if you don't have a calcium reactor, my flag immediately goes off to testing error or equipment yeah. to testing failure. Yeah, I mean, it's sim and then again, back to uh, what we were saying about the, the probes, rather than recalibrate, just grab one of these and test it. And you, maybe it says 6.0 or maybe it says six, maybe, it's, maybe it's reading the seven packet like pretty low, recalibrate and then stick it back in, see if uh, that's the problem, see if okay. that solved it. So assuming that you do have a problem uh, and it just materialized and you're going to identify the piece of equipment that failed. Yeah. It's probably a calcium reactor, but it could be something else. Uh, identify that, turn it off, uh, or take it offline. And then what you're going to want to do is raise it fast again. So people, again, will say, whoa, 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 we should only raise it a tenth of a point at a time. No, 
the water's poisoned at that low of a pH, it's actually like dissolving the coral skeleton. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, like uh, inside the tank, not good idea. And just for a reference point, you know, at like people run their calcium reactors at like seven point five, yeah, seven point oh, six point eight. Yeah. yeah, and those are achievable inside the display tank for yeah. sure. So it's melting old coral skeleton in the reactor. It's the same thing's happening in your tank, <laughs> and it's super bad. So now, how do we so raise it up? We're gonna raise it up quick. Yeah. Uh, and so the way you're gonna do that is with uh, uh, probably an alkalinity additive, mm -hmm. right? Uh, soda ash uh, being the number one, and I would mix it up into a solution. I just have this on hand at all times in most cases. Like, buy a pouch of this stuff, and you you know have, have a, it mixed. Have it mixed, and you have yeah. it on your house all the time. Uh, and so the other one is Kelkwasser, and again, usually would mix it up and you know take off the top part of it. But even the slurry might be okay in this case. But you're going to dose very small amounts of it. But the goal is to get it up into a safe range as fast as possible. Mm. And like once you start to approach that 7.8, like uh, you're probably getting there pretty close. Like yeah. if I got like 7.7, .7, I just probably stop dosing and let it naturally gas off or mm. whatnot. Uh, but yeah, you're gonna wanna fix it right away. And the new most common things would be a uh, soda ash two part or uh, like this uh, Kalkwasser uh, diluted water. Yeah, and then I mean, after the, after the fact, when you do, if you do run into this problem and you have fixed the pH, the next day's problem is going to be probably related to high alkalinity because you added some buffers in there and you can adjust those pretty easily too but yeah so actually going back to the number six True. also if you have a super huge overdose in the saw of like a two-part or whatnot and saw your alkalinity and ph rise you're probably gonna have all kinds of precipitation issues yep. in your tank and so once you fix that all of a sudden uh you're gonna get it back down to 8.3 or whatnot into a safe range don't be surprised when you're going to start to see uh, all of your calcium alkalinity start to deplete, yeah. right? Uh, so anytime one of these things happen, it isn't just fix it, it's monitor what happens every few hours for at least the next day or so uh, and get a pulse so you can correct them. So monitor mm -hmm. your calcium, your alkalinity and the pH. And now that you know what to do, in most cases, you'll be able to save the tank uh, super fast. All right, so number eight here of pH fails. This is actually one of my favorite because this is like confused all the time. And I see this uh, uh, mentioned in the wrong ways so yeah. all the time as well. What is it? That's, uh, that's gonna be assuming that monitoring alarms for pH is about tank chemistry. When actually, uh, as you could tell by the last couple uh, of uh, mistakes, it's about the equipment because in those last couple of mistakes, it was equipment failure that led to those mistakes and that's what we're monitoring pH for. Yeah. I hear all the time like, well, why do I monitor pH? It really doesn't mean anything to me, blah, blah, blah. And like, I get that because it's actually somewhat true. Yeah, if, right? if everything's in check, then there's really no reason to monitor. I mean, if I'm chasing growth, you know, getting, trying to get faster growth, whatever, I can get to 8.3. But really, as long as it's somewhere between 7.8, 8.3 every day, the tank's going to do just fine. Yeah. Uh, but, so like, why monitor it? So it has nothing to do with trying to find out whether or not my chemistry is perfect. Right. It's 100% in relation to the alarms and telling you that major equipment failed on your tank. Right. Right? Yeah. So my dosing pump overdosed, mm -hmm. my calcium reactor overdosed, my outer top off or Kelkwasser reactor uh, or outer top off with Kelkwasser in it. Any, almost any alkalinity and calcium solution failed and has been overdosed to my tank. I mean, it will tell me if my cat knocked over a bucket of yeah, it into my true. sump, you Absolutely. know, whatever. Or, or my kid decided to play mad scientist yeah. and dose it in there. <laughs> and so it's 100% about equipment related failures and overdosing uh, chemicals for the most part. And so don't think about when I have the monitoring alarms that I don't really care about that or not. It's because it's nothing to do with that. It's all about making sure you catch, capture things when they actually fail and then give you time mm. to get there like immediately and go solve in the ways that we just recommended. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you mentioned it, and we mentioned that like monitoring or having that mindset of it being chemistry related starts to kind of lead you down those paths of playing mad scientist because you're monitoring it so close, you're thinking it's chemistry related, and now you start to tinker with it to try to get it in your target range, and it actually turns out to be just fine. Yeah, in, in reality, actually, you know, there's a, a lot of things that we try to do here to help people get, you know, from year one of reefing to year mm. two, three, four, five, whatever. And a lot of information will just get you from one to two or so. Yeah. Uh, but after you get past that, or even sometimes after just one year, 
What happens is the difference between a tank crash and a super stable, you know, successful tank is how fast you know when equipment fails. The true. Because it will fail. I mean, you're talking about, you know, hobby grade equipment. Yep. It is not designed to last 15 years. No, and you spend you know? like a majority of your time either at work or sleeping. So the time that you're actually home watching the tank uh, is probably the least likely time when it's going to fail, in which case monitoring. Yeah, in fact, just with your eyes, with your calcium reactor two-part or uh, uh, calcwasser failed. How do I know? I know because either the cloud, the tank is cloudy white or stuff is just dying. That's <laughs> my only real pulse on it, yeah. uh, unless I have a monitor or whatnot. And so the monitor can be two things. You can just be a little monitor that's on the tank and I can walk by and just see it. Most people aren't going to perform like tests on it like daily to know for sure. Yeah. Um, but it could be a little monitor that I see it, uh, the pH uh, uh, just in real time. Or it can be something that uh, actually sends me notifications to my phone, like an Apex or Senai or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, that is definitely one of them. All right, so number nine mistake in relation to pH. This is one I think a lot of people kind of have a hard time getting a grasp of. And it's actually the number one cause of pH uh, reductions in the tank and not being able to maintain that 8.3 is actually the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the room not in the tank itself, it'll end up in the tank, but controlling the amount of carbon dioxide in the room. So number nine, what is the biggest failure here? This is uh, the first step in troubleshooting, like your pH uh, issue, or if you're hovering around those low ranges, just open some windows. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, these are uh, sparks, uh, there's sparked a lot of threads on the reef, on the forums, Ask BRS TV, Facebook group. A lot of people are just, you know, I have this problem with pH or I'm at, you know, mid sevens and I want to be in the eights and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm having a hard time troubleshooting it when in reality our, our first response to that is, well, have you tried opening some windows and then checking back in like an hour or two? Yeah, assuming your alkalinity is in a normal range, mm -hmm. almost every time it's too much carbon dioxide in your room from you or your pets breathing or whatnot. And the quickest uh, way to identify that for sure is just go open your windows. I don't care if it's cold or hot or whatever, mm -hmm. like because you want to know the answer to this solution. So go open uh, all the windows for you know six hours or so, yeah. or some of them, whatever is tolerable to you. Uh, get some fresh air into the house and watch how the tank responds to that. If the pH goes up because of that, uh, then you know what? Ambient that was CO2. definitely your, your problem. Yeah. It's the amount of CO2 in the room. And just for reference point, the way this works is the CO2 in the room, if it's high, will uh, change with the gas exchange on the surface of the water and your skimmer. The CO2 will get into the tank, turn into carbonic acid, and then lower the pH. So that's like the mechanism that's happening there but it's all related to that amount of CO2 that's in your room. So somewhat related to that is actually number 10, and there's a lot of different people out there that give you the wrong advice on how to solve mm. it. And like they don't hit on that CO2 thing in your room, and they tell you to solve it chemically. Right? Oh yeah, true. Right, and so number 10 uh, mistake, in my opinion, is... Dumping buffers in the tank. So there's pH deluxe and pH booster du bu buffer deluxe and things like that the available out there, uh, but using them is a mistake. Yeah, so most of those things are actually alkalinity additives, and so when you add them, you're going to raise the alkalinity. So it will raise the pH temporarily, in some cases uh, longer term, uh, using like borate salts and whatnot. Mm. But when you're adding it, you're most of the time adding it temporarily. And so if I want to fix my pH, I keep have to keep adding it. And I'm not adding any calcium with it, so I'm getting totally out of whack. I would not use anything related buffer. There are some super unique scenarios. If you really, really know what you're doing, you're trying to achieve a very specific goal. Yeah. And it could help, but like it's so rare. I just would never, ever do it. Uh, and specifically, the ones that have borate salts in them, mm are one of the bigger problems because false reading yeah it'll it'll trick your alkalinity test kit because your alkalinity test kit will think that uh, the borate is readily available alkalinity which i in like you know technically it is but what we're actually measuring with the alkalinity test kit is how much carbon it's in the water to make our mm. calcium carbonate skeleton for the uh, coral. So what we're doing is tricking the test kit. It's going to make me think my alkalinity, carbon alkalinity is okay when it's not. Yeah. So just using those buffers actually messes all, all kinds of chemistry in the tank and just wouldn't advise it. So there are other much better ways out there to manage your pH than this. So uh, that was the number 10.
All right, so there's tons of better ways to manage the pH in a reef tank than using anything called pH buffer. And that leads right into number 11, which is? Yeah, that's using alkalinity additives as uh, your pH, for increasing your pH. So naturally, you know, soda ash and kalkwasser have a pH boosting effect. So if I'm using those as my alkalinity uh, additive, to uh, maintain alkalinity, to some to, to some degree, to some effect, I'll have a pH boosting effect. Yeah. So basically, what's happening is uh, you're adding the soda ash or the kelp wasser or whatnot uh, to the tank, and uh, it's actually binding up the carbon dioxide that's in the tank, uh, which makes it unavailable to make carbonate. Mm. Right. So it's not that you're going to use those and dose them to try to fix pH. Yeah. It's the fact that you chose the soda ash as your alkalinity solution that's matched your two part that will just elevate the pH on its own. Right. Mm. So you're not doing it for that purpose necess necessarily, but it's just kind of a side product. Same thing with dosing the uh, kelp washer and your auto top off or whatnot. Yeah. Is it binds up the CO2 that's in the tank water uh, temporarily. It will get added back in over time with gas exchange. So it's just part part of uh, daily maintenance, but it is a much better way to manage the pH of your tank with just selecting the right additive system for calcium and alkalinity. Okay, so that also leads into number 12 here, uh, mistakes, is a lot of people simply don't understand the role that your protein skimmer has in maintaining the pH of your tank. Yeah, we're talking about the air exchange that happens inside the body of that skimmer versus just the surface agitation on the water or rolling through your plumbing and your filtration and stuff. Just the, the difference in the amount of air volume that is getting mixed into your tank, uh, what, hundreds of times greater in a skimmer body than surface agitation? Yeah, so there's two places uh, predominantly that there is gas exchange happening at the room in the tank. Mm. It's the surface of the water there, uh, which actually isn't that much surface, and especially if it's not really you know rolling or tumbling right, over. Right. A little bit going down your overflow, but if you look at a protein skimmer and all those little bubbles in there, the amount of surface area inside of that and the amount of gas exchange like, greatly exceeds what's happening on the top of the tank. Yeah. So uh, note that the skimmer is actually the thing that's really controlling the amount of CO2 that is or isn't in the water. Yeah. Uh, and you can use the skimmer to actually affect that. So the number one way, uh, that's using the CO2 scrubbing media. So mm -hmm. I can uh, alter my, I can add a reactor like this to my skimmer in air intake line. So rather than it drawing this CO2 laden, you know, air ambient air from my room where my dogs and my pets and me and my family are breathing, uh, I can have it draw through CO2 scrubbing media first and then uh, scrub off that CO2 uh, before it gets into my tank. Yeah, so you're mixing uh, all that air uh, in the skimmer with air that has very little to no CO2 in it. Mm -hmm. And so it will increase uh, or decrease the amount of carbon dioxide in the tank, which increases the pH. Uh, the uh, alternative to that is actually running the line outside. Yeah. Right. And this is, uh, I think now that you got CO2 media, it's just like so easy to do right underneath your tank. It's probably why it's becoming so popular. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you can run a line outside, that's actually cheaper and in some ways easier. Uh, and so if you just run a line outside, it will suck air from outside that presumably has low CO2 levels because it's uh, outdoor air, yeah. right? Uh, the only downside to that is you'll probably reduce the airflow going into your skimmer and you might have to compensate for that. I'd also think about putting some carbon or whatnot on the intake yeah. uh, to the tube because you know, who knows what people are spraying outside by your house, you know, pesticides, mm -hmm. uh, fertilizers, maybe your car parks next to it and you're getting carbon yeah. dioxide. So like make sure you're sucking from an area that isn't going to get a lot of chemicals or anything into it. That's probably another like fear that a lot of people have. So they, you know, tend to not do that. Right. But yeah, the CO2 media works really well. So just understanding that the skimmer is actually one of the things that plays the biggest role in your pH just by the introduction of CO2 into the tank. All right, so number 13 is another one that I've actually been guilty <laughs> of, and what is it? Yeah, a lot of guys, a lot of people are running refugiums, or they have their pH probes in the back of their tank, but uh, this relates to putting your probe right next to light, where algae and coralline and different types of things can grow onto the probe and uh, ultimately affect its reading. Yeah, so yeah, having those in places that are dark or separated from your, re your refugium or your display lights, probably the best place to place them. Yeah. In fact, so this happened to me and I had a 90 gallon wave tank that didn't have a sump. And so I just put the probe right into the tank. I didn't know any better. Yeah. 
and uh, it failed inside of like five months, right? And so I contacted Pinpoint about it, and he's like, well, I'll give you half off of a new one or something like that. I sent him back the old one, and he's like, dude, this thing looks like it's been used for years, you know? <laughs> uh, and basically, it's just because it's in the light, what happens is algae grows all over the probe, mm. coralline algae was growing all over it, the coralline algae actually got into the seals and burst it open, right? Yeah. Uh, I shouldn't say burst it open, but leaked yeah. uh, fluid. So, like make sure that you're not putting it anywhere that's going to get direct light on it or at least as minimal as possible yeah. otherwise you're going to reduce the lifespan of your probe all right so number 14 fail this is another super common one and it's i think it's because the sump designs and where they put these things in many cases but what is it yeah this is uh testing downstream of your ph of your uh dosing stuff so if i'm dosing two part if i'm dosing soda ash or if i have you know calquasser in my ato and that pours in the chamber before my ph probe every time that that thing gets a dose i'm getting a false reading or uh you know a different reading on my ph probe so now i'm seeing these wild fl fluctuations and i'm like i'm wondering why that is it's because i'm testing downstream of this stuff that's affecting it in fact, a lot of sumps actually have all the little brackets in the same place so that your dosing and your probes are like right next to each other. So yeah. <laughs> uh, just fix that because yeah. it's not a good solution. You can use the temp probes maybe that way or something, but mm -hmm. you want to test before for the dosing, so in the chamber. So basically it has to change the chemistry of the whole tank before it gets back to it right. and registers. And now the downside of that is it, changes, it has to change the chemistry of the whole tank before a problem is alerted. But like that is way better than all the false positives that you're True. gonna get uh, otherwise. And you may have a different scenario in your specific install and change, but in the vast majority of cases, you know, dosing into the same place your pH probe is, uh, is a bad idea or before it, you're probably going to want to put it be, uh, before uh, all of your dosing. All right, so number 15, this is another one I bet you almost all of you are guilty of because I know I was. Absolutely. Uh, what is it? Because every time I go into my fish store and I think I need pH calibration solution, I buy one packet. And these things are like less than a dollar in most cases and I just spend like the 10, maybe even 20 bucks to buy a couple packets of, uh, multiple packets of both, your 10 and your seven, uh, or calcium reactor, your four and your seven. And uh, so that way I, I can test it once a month, you know, instead of recalibrate. And if I do have to recalibrate, I have more solution to just recalibrate. Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely ordered the first time. I ordered one of each and then I screwed up the <laughs> calibration and now I had to wait five days to get more of it yep. uh, through the mail. Uh, and then I'm like, all right, I'm gonna get ahead of this. I'm gonna order two. And then you like mess up one or like, you're like, I wanna test it two months from now. Like, oh, now I gotta place another order. Yeah. You know, nah, like this stuff is so cheap. Order five or something at a time and it'll cover the gap between where you're there. And like, just don't order one is definitely, definitely a mistake. All right, so there's a bonus one in here, number 16, <laughs> actually, of pH uh, failures. What is it? Yeah, this is using soda ash for occasional tank adjustments. So uh, I'm just low on out my tank. I tested my tank, it's low on alkalinity, and I grab my jug of soda ash and I go to the BRS calculator and it tells me to dose, you know, 200 mils or something like that, and I use soda ash to make that adjustment. Your pH, you're going to notice it uh, immediately. Just went up five tenths of a point. Right. Right. Uh, and so the uh, knee jerk on here is, well, I use the uh, soda ash for daily adjustments. Uh, mm. You know, why wouldn't I use it to like larger occasional adjustments? Yeah. Right? And it's just because it raises the tiny bit of pH that it does today is not good for large doses. Right. So everyone should own one jug of sodium bicarbonate. Cost five bucks to make a gallon. It will probably last, last you year multiple more. years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so spend the five bucks and make a jug of sodium bicarbonate so you can make alkalinity adjustments in your tank with having almost no effect to the actual pH when you do that uh, adjustment. So that is uh, all of them today, but you know what? We have a uh, big takeaway for today. Yeah. So like there's a number one thing of all the things you heard today, most important, what do you think it is? Most important uh, for me and probably for you too is that assumption of uh, the pH monitoring, monitoring tank chemistry, but actually it's monitoring your equipment, which ultimately is gonna help you save your tank. 
Yeah. So yeah, the, the higher pH 8.3 will help you grow corals faster if that's your goal. But really, monitoring pH is about monitoring the equipment in the tank and capturing those fails, like mm. the moment they happen, so you can save your tank. That's definitely it. So if you want to see all of our failures of the past, <laughs> they're quickly building up. We have a whole playlist right here. You can go see all of our failures uh, with salt mixes. Yep. Uh, we can see them with protein skimmers and the hot one refugiums.